So we're all equal. The divine right of kings is done away with. We all have the same human rights which we, from the Creator, which we also call what? And John Locke called them this, and Jefferson called them this. What are Natural rights or unalienable rights. Unalienable rights. Some say inalienable rights, and I guess it depends on whether you went to Princeton or Harvard, whatever. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. Unalienable rights. Now let's go on. We're still on page 124. Now this is William Blackstone. Remember who he was. He says, those rights then which God and nature have established and are therefore called natural rights, natural rights, such as our life and liberty, need not the aid of human laws to be more effectually invested in every man than they are. What's he saying? Does it help to have the legislature say that we have an alienable right? Does that give more force to it? Does that give more help to it? No. Neither do they receive any additional strength when declared by the municipal laws to be inviolable. On the contrary, no human legislature has power to abridge or destroy them unless the owner shall himself commit some act that amounts to a forfeiture. I ask you, how do you, uh, can you forfeit your inalienable rights? How can you lose them? Can someone take them from you? Well, someone can certainly take your life. Can't necessarily take your right to life, but they can take your life. Can they take your property? Yes. Can they take your liberty? Yes. But not without what? Not without coming under the judgment of the Creator who gave you those laws. Does everybody see that? Yes, people can do bad things to us. But if they interfere with your inalienable rights, which the Creator gave you, they will answer at least to him. Did you all follow that? Okay. But I ask again, how else can you lose them? Other than somebody taking them from you, how else can you lose them? By forfeiting yourself. How do you forfeit your right to life? Okay, going against God's law, but how, you, give me an example. How do you forfeit your right to life? This is what he's saying here. By dying? Well, how do you forfeit your right? How do you come to the point of saying, I must give up my life? Come on, folks. You know this. Right. By taking someone else's life. The law of the Creator says, if you take someone's life, premeditated first degree murder, you will forfeit your own life. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? You will, you will forfeit your inalienable right to life. So that's what, that's what Blackstone is saying. Uh, unless the owner shall himself commit some act that amounts to a forfeiture. How do you forfeit your liberty? How could you forfeit your liberty? By doing what? By breaking the laws to the point where you can't be trusted with your liberty anymore. You are a danger to society. So we're going to have to put you in jail or banish you from society. That takes away your liberty. See how you can do that? Inalienable rights. Beautiful, protected uh, privileges given to you by, as Locke and Blackstone say, the Creator.
as Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence. Do you realize in our state, and in a number of other states now, the legislature passed a law. It is law that elementary school children memorize the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That's the law, that young children need to memorize that. I think it was passed before most of you, or since most of you were in elementary school, but they do that now. That's, isn't that something? What beautiful concepts these are. Hope they know what they're memorizing, but <laughs> now you do, okay? Do you have any other rights besides inalienable rights? Yes. Yes, you do. What do we call those? Vested. We call those vested rights. What's the difference? What are vested rights? Vested rights are rights that individuals can have that are given to you by by the government, which really is the people, right? Uh, can they be changed? Can they be taken away? Yes, because they're given to you by man, basically, by, by society, by the government. Can you think of some examples? Examples of uh, vested rights? This, this hits real close to home. How about the right to drive on a public highway? I know most of you think that should be an inalienable right, <laughs> right? But it's not. Now you have an inalienable right to drive or to travel or to move on your property, but you don't have an inalienable right to drive on my highway. See, I own a piece of that highway out there, right? We all do. So this is not totally yours. So we get together as a community and we say, we need to have an orderly structure uh, for the use of that highway because it's, we all own it. What are we going to do? Well, as we said before, we're going to require that you know where the steering wheel is and you know where the brake pedal is and you know a few other things. And we're going to require that you're 16 years old before you get behind a wheel out there on that street. What do you think? Can we change it? Can we say... Uh, uh, you're going to have to be 18 now. We could do that. You wouldn't like it, most of you. <laughs> but we could do that. Because that's a vested right given to you by government, and they can change it. Does everybody see that? Let me ask you this question. What is the purpose of vested rights? Why would you even have vested rights? Think that through. Why do you want to have rules for the for the uh, driving on a public highway? So you don't get so you don't hurt other people, right? So you don't take other people's life and liberty and property. So really, the purpose of vested rights is to protect what? Unalienable rights. Isn't that great? Here's another example the right to a trial by jury. See, that's not, you were not born with that right as a person, right? As a citizen, you may be born with it because that is a right that's created by government. And what does a jury trial do or supposed to do? It's supposed to be the best uh, method that we have come up with to do what? Have a just trial, which means really to protect what? The inalienable rights of the people. Isn't that amazing? And the government, meaning the people, can make changes in a jury system. So this is a, this is a vested right, and the purpose of vested rights is to protect inalienable rights. And we gave, you the, we gave you those two examples, the right to drive on a public highway and the right to a trial by jury. You have a lot of other vested rights. Anybody think of any? A couple of them are in the book here. Uh, the right to go hunting during certain seasons. See, in our state, we've got a lot of great mountainous hunting areas. And uh, to, to kind of give some order to this thing, the... the 
the state says, the legislature says, this is hunting season, and in order to preserve the game from year to year, we're going to only allow a certain amount of hunters and so forth. So you get a hunter's license and you get a tag and so forth. This is all vested rights. You have a certain right given to you to go hunt during a certain season. You see that? Otherwise, it'd be chaos out there. Anytime. Okay. Now let's turn to... Uh, Turn to page 155 and 56, and at the bottom of 125, excuse me, 125, the bottom of 125 and the top of 126, you see a list of some unalienable rights. I don't know if you thought of these or not, but uh, see if you do. The right of self-government, well, we've heard that. The right to bear arms for self-defense, we know about that. The right to own, develop, and dispose of property. The right to make personal choices, free conscience. Look at this, the right to choose a profession. You ever think that is an inalienable right? Yeah. You can do what you choose to do. Look at the next one, the right to choose a mate. You ever think of that as an inalienable right? The right to beget one's kind. What does that mean? The right to procreate. See? The right to have children. We have some governments that want to take away that right. This is an inalienable right. Right to petition, so forth and so on. Look at this, uh, the right to contrive and invent. Uh, the right to explore the natural resources of the earth. If they're in their state of nature, which we'll learn about in Principle 14, then people have a right to explore them, not to be uh, kept out by some artificial proclamation so you can't even go into it. That's happening, isn't it? Okay. Anyway, there's a lot of other examples of inalienable rights there. Any question about those? What does this phrase mean? The pursuit of happiness. When are you really happy? Or when, are, when is your pursuit of happiness showing some fulfillment? When you what? Yeah. When you can enjoy the benefits of your labor, you can develop it, you can dispose of it. Uh, in other words, it, it, it really makes life worth something, doesn't it? And that's why Jefferson actually used that phrase. The pursuit of happiness, which the right to enjoy the benefits of your labors helps us do. Okay? Enjoyment of property. Well, even though we listed all of these inalienable rights, really there's three great inalienable rights into which you can put them all. What are they? Well, just exactly what Jefferson said, right? The right to life the right to liberty, and, as we've defined, the right to pursue happiness, which, is, which follows the right of property. Now, 